So today we're going to compare two expensive Cadillacs of yesteryear, this 1967 Cadillac Eldorado to my 1984 Cadillac Seville. Now this 1967 Eldorado was quite an expensive car in its day with a base price of about $6,300, which is about $60,000 in today's money. So it was not a cheap car at all for the time. You have to remember this was back before the 84-month financing and things that they offer today. You were probably able to finance this car over three years, maybe four years at best. So it was pretty expensive payment-wise. But it's an absolutely stellar-looking Cadillac. I love this rear three-quarter view with these blade taillights that would inspire so many Cadillacs subsequent to this vehicle, including the Cadillac CTS that came out in 2003, as well as the SRX around that time period. And even the Cadillac Evoque, which later became the XLR in production. You can certainly see the inspiration for the Evoque's rear end in this rear three-quarter view of the 67 Eldorado. This is one of, I believe, the most beautiful Cadillacs ever produced. Maybe even the most beautiful. And this is an 18,000-mile car that I picked up from Texas oh, about eight months ago. A YouTube viewer actually sent it to me. It is... Factory original black paint, no vinyl roof, red leather interior. And, I mean, how do you pass up a car like this? And it's got quite a few options, including automatic climate control, cruise control, disc brakes, trunk release. It doesn't have rear power windows. It has manual windows in the rear, which was only something that was offered in 1967 as standard equipment. You can see the disc brakes here. It's a bit hard to see in the sunlight, but there is a caliper in there and a rotor, trust me. Let's take a quick look under hood for a second. And here you can see the 340 horsepower Cadillac 429 V8. This was offered in the Eldorado only in 1967. In 1968, the 472 would come out. You can see it's a super smooth runner and not a bad engine overall. It actually feels peppier than the later 472s. Let's take a look inside. This red leather interior is just immaculate, and I love how bright the red is on the red leather interior. They had a couple different reds in this year. One was more of a darker red, and there you can see the crank handle for the rear window in the back that you just crank, and then the window opens. There's no power window. And here's the power lock which is vacuum actuated on the Eldorado, not electric. It's nice and quiet, very refined overall. And turning to the back, let's hear the exhaust. Again, just a smooth, quiet runner. There's the resonator you can see there briefly as well too. Okay, let's compare it to the 84 Seville. So here we have the 67 Eldorado on the left and the 84 Seville on the right. And there's about 17 years separating these vehicles. And you notice a number of styling elements are pretty similar, including that power dome-ish hood that both have. And the 84 Seville is a bit more muted than the Eldorado. And both have that wind split molding running down the center. And let's call them very sharp creases overall on the vehicle. The 67 here certainly has much sharper creases. And the reason why it has that look is that GM styling chief at the time, Bill Mitchell, believed that a high-end car like this Cadillac Eldorado should have creases like that, just like the crease in a man's pants and well-tailored clothing. And that was the philosophy that Cadillac embraced for this car. And you can see in particular that front end, the rear quarter panel also has a very sharp, pronounced crease in it. Just a handsome car overall. Notice the square wheel arches, which would be a Cadillac hallmark for a number of years. Although the 84 Seville behind this Eldorado doesn't have those, nor did the 76 to 79 Seville. But other Cadillacs had these square wheel arches, and I think they look quite handsome and overall just a nice, sharp, tailored, crisp look. And taking a look at the driver's side, you can see that feature line that's near the bottom of the vehicle. It's just a beautiful line overall, and the body tucks in underneath that feature line and then rolls in toward the roof on the upper portion of it. it just gives the car this wonderful non-slab-sided look that, honestly, the 84 Seville, if 
behind it has a bit more of a slab-sided look. The 67 Eldorado has a lot more tumble home, as it's called, meaning that the body tilts inward toward the roof. And you can see here these slotted wheel discs. Cadillac actually had to ask the supplier to smoothen the openings on those wheel discs because they found that people were cutting themselves. They actually were so sharp that they were somewhat dangerous in removing those wheel discs. Let's take a look at the interior one more time. And it's that beautiful red leather interior. This is going to be hard to beat on the 84 Seville, just in terms of the color. But the materials are pretty good on this. I wouldn't say that they're overly stellar, though. And I also find one interesting feature is on the driver's side, you can see there's two vents, one that's pointed right out at the driver and one that points down at the driver's legs. I don't quite know why they put that second one down there. It's kind of strange. It doesn't really do much of anything. And the door panel, you notice there's no area to pull the door closed aside from you stick your hand in the door panel in that slot, which is somewhat awkward. It's also not too much in the rear seat room. Let's take a look at how this manual window opens. You can see it retracts into the sail panel as opposed to down. And as I mentioned before, this car has the manual windows, not the power operated. And here, let's crank it back out. I think that's kind of a cool feature. Some Lincolns did that too. The Lincoln Mark III and the Lincoln Mark IV, the rear side glass also retracted into the sail panel as opposed to retracting down. And here you can see that pocket in the door again where you pull it closed. There's no other place on the door to do that. It's felt lined and flocked so that it feels nice, but it's just kind of an awkward thing. Let's take one more look under hood in the El Dorado now before we transition to the 84 Seville. Now, as I previously mentioned, this car has Cadillac's 429 cubic inch V8 be the only year for the 429 under hood. And this is a major difference between the 67 Aldo and the 84 Seville. There's a lot more power and torque with this particular engine, which is a high compression engine versus the 4.1 liter engine in the 84 Seville. A couple things. Here's the heater control valve. This is for the automatic climate control. This allows varying amounts of coolant into the heater core, and that's what varies the temperature when you turn the little thumb wheel. There's the blower there. You can see Cadillac, as opposed to other cars, had a cutout there to change the blower motor pretty easily. And then this funny-looking tank that's hanging off of this brace is the airlift for the rear shocks that operates off of vacuum. You can also see the Turbo Hydromatic 425 transmission here, which points forward. You can see the half shaft there driving the wheels. That's a cruise control box right there. And then the torque converter is right behind the engine. And the transmission is driven by a Morse high vo chain and points forward in the vehicle. And it connects to the final drive, which connects to those half shafts. Pretty beefy setup. The Olds version of that would be used in the GMC Motorhome, which was front-wheel drive as well. Let's take a look at the 84 Seville. And in contrast to the 67 Eldorado, you can see, like I said, the car doesn't have all that much tumble home, and the body sides are pretty flat. They're not overly curved. Aside from below that lower feature line, they curve pretty severely inward. But notice the wheels are out at the corners in this car, which was a pretty contemporary look for the vehicle. Most wheels on cars in this era were pretty far inboard. It's one of the few cars where they're sticking out and almost in exact line with the body. Take a look at the rear tire in particular. You can see that it's out pretty far in comparison to other vehicles of the era. Overall, this 84 Seville is a somewhat controversially styled vehicle. It was introduced in the 1980 model year, ran through the 1985 model year, very expensive car. Base price of about $22,500 in 1984, which is about $65,000 today. This was not a cheap ride by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, when it came out in 1980, it was priced at $20,000 base price, which was the most expensive production Cadillac that you could buy at the time. And it was the first Cadillac to really cross into the $20,000 mark from a base price perspective, aside from the factory limousines. You can also see the wheel discs in this car with the red centers. That was something that was redesigned after one year because the original wheel discs on this car sat proud of the vehicle. And when you went through car washes, they made a lot of noise and people scraped the curbs with them. 
You can see the car does have the ca typical Cadillac rooftop hood to it, and it has these fiber optic indicators. That's the bright light, the headlight, and the turn signal indicator that light up when they're working. The 67 Aldo just has the turn signal indicator atop the fender peak to make sure the turn signals are working. And by the way, that's the only turn signal on the car. There isn't one on the dashboard in the Eldorado. This is a plastic hood ornament made by the Ald Company. You can see there the merlets in the logo, the wingless birds. And turning to the inside, this is one area where this car is especially rich. It does have a lot of fake wood grain that doesn't have a very convincing appeal. But the significant button tufting, very, very soft leather, and soft touch door panels just give this car an overall super rich look to it on the inside. It also has this deep hooded instrument cluster. That, that part that I'm touching there is a shim that they made in varying lengths to close the gap to the door, which you can see on the other side. And you can see the Bose speakers on the package shelf there, along with the reading lights in the sail panel. Just a wonderfully rich interior that I would say when you drive this vehicle, it does feel expensive in spite of the faux wood grain. By 1984, they had also lost the chrome on the vents and around the various gauges, which I think gave it an overall cleaner look. And there's a supersized glove box with a vent and a plug that just says Seville, which is symmetric with the driver's side, so this could be exported easily. And there's little switches to turn the vents off if you want. You can see them there. It's a nice feature for the vehicle. This does have tilt telescopic wheel. And then it also has a digital dash, which I'll turn on now so you can take a look at it. It's got this vacuum fluorescent display that was trendy for the time. I don't know how it looks. It looks kind of strange because all the other instruments are orange. And you can see the car does have the flat floor because it is front-wheel drive, just like the 67 Eldorado does, too. And a beautiful kind of faux cloisonné Cadillac logo in the middle of the wheel. You can see also the passenger mirror joystick control there, which is power-operated. So is that one. That is not a manual joystick for the mirror. And I'm pushing the lock and unlock button where it says lock on the door trim panel forward. This is different than every other General Motors car where to lock the car, the plunger goes rearward. I have no idea why it's different on this particular Seville. Let's pop the hood and take a look at the heart of the beast, the HT4100 V8. Now, by this point, the 4.1 liter V8, which was introduced in the 1982 model year, was making 135 horsepower and 200 pound-feet of torque, which really wasn't that much. You compare that to the 1980 V8 that came out in the Seville, which made 145 horsepower, not all that much more, but 270 pound-feet of torque, way, way more than 200 pound-feet of torque that this 4.1 liter engine made. You can also see there's the electric air compressor as opposed to that big vacuum thing on the 67 Eldorado. It frankly worked better. The electric one works better than the vacuum one. And you can also take a look at all the vacuum hoses and everything under hood here for emissions. This car even has a vacuum pump. That's that pump underneath the upper radiator hose there that's on the accessory drive because this engine didn't make enough vacuum to power all the accessories. It didn't also in the front-wheel drive cars when this 4.1 made it into the front-wheel drive DeVille's uh, in 1985. Those had an electric vacuum pump in the driver's side fender well. So if you turn the key on on them and you hear this buzzing noise that you're not sure what it is, that's what it is on those 85 and 86 DeVille's. Again, much cleaner over here without all the vacuum hoses and certainly a lot more horsepower. Let's take a step back, take one more look at these vehicles, and then let's take them both for a drive. Well, here we are driving the Eldorado, and I have to say this car is certainly a looker on the inside and out, and it drives pretty well overall. I would say the 429 cubic inch V8 is happier, frankly, than the 472, at least at part throttle. At full throttle, the 472 and the high compression 500 that came out in 1970 certainly are faster than this 429 but 
This 429 really is a great engine from a drivability perspective. They did have some issues with it with the aluminum timing cover and the oil pump being integral to that, the timing cover wearing out and you losing oil pressure, but this is just an 18,000 mile car and it will never get high mileage on it. So don't have to worry about that. I'm always changing the oil very frequently. So there's always clean oil in it. But overall inside the vehicle, it's quite quiet. I will say though, that this is not a luxury car ride. It's a pretty stiff ride. And compared to other lesser GM cars of the era, it's a pretty unrefined ride as well. This car has the single leaf rear springs in the back, has a three quarter length frame that terminates at the front of the leaf shackle for the rear suspension. And when you go over bumps, at least big bumps, you definitely hear it in the cabin, some boominess that you don't hear on the full frame GM cars with the four coil suspension. So that frankly, if I would have bought this car in 1967 would have been a letdown. The style would certainly have not been a letdown. The engine would have been, I would say, commensurate with my expectations. But the suspension and the ride itself is not what I would say is up to par and probably the biggest Achilles heel of this vehicle versus others. You drive this versus a Mark III as an example, which came out in 1969. And of course, this body style Eldorado was still going then. The Mark III would have felt years beyond this Eldorado in terms of refinement. It would have been a, a much more, well, let's call it much less sporty ride in the Mark III, but I think most people would have picked that over this just on the ride any day. That said, certainly a place to be, you know, in this cockpit and it just is beautiful in this red leather interior. Hard to complain about that. Some of the materials are okay, I would say. The dash material is okay, but not great. The Mark III, again, I would say had better interior materials, but still this car, when you pull up to someone's house or any place, it certainly screams money like almost nothing else does. Here we are in the 84 Seville, getting on the freeway here. And the first thing you notice when you compare this to the 67 Eldorado is the ride is so much better. I mean, it's not even close, the difference in the ride. And this car is so much quieter on the inside too. Not that the 67 is noisy, but GM did a really nice job in the noise levels in this 84 Seville. It is whisper quiet in here, no wind noise, no road noise just a great freeway cruiser. I mean, it's notably quieter than modern cars on this concrete pavement, probably due to its full frame and four coil suspension. This car also has Cadillac's first independent rear suspension set up on it, and it works phenomenally well. You can hear them going over these expansion strips on the road, and you don't hear anything in the car. The other thing that you notice driving this vehicle versus the 67 Eldorado is the lack of power. This 4.1 liter V8, it's uh, it's pretty anemic to say the least. So it made about 100, between 125, 135 horsepower depending upon what year and in what vehicles you got it. And it's just, it's, it's great because it's super smooth. It's even smoother than the 429 under hood in the 67, but aside from the smoothness, that's about the only thing good I could say about it. It's quiet too, I'll give it that. You really don't hear the engine, but it just doesn't have any power. It's fine if you drive it normally, but passing power, nothing. But I will say that it's very comfortable, got the air conditioning on in here. Super comfortable car to drive on the freeway, super quiet, very thick door glass windshield, etc. You just don't hear anything driving this car. And so despite the lack of power, it actually is great to drive and it handles pretty well too. So it depends on what you want. If you want a cruiser for the freeway that also gets good gas mileage, this car gets about 24, 25 miles per gallon freeway. It'll do, you can see I'm doing 75. It'll do 75, 80. 
this is not a car that you're going to go 85 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour. You're really just pushing it. But 75, 80 miles an hour, you'll get good gas mileage. It's quiet. It's fun to drive. That's what I'd say. Hope you enjoyed this comparison. Thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. And it was shot in part on site at Masterworks Automotive Services in Madison Heights, Michigan, where I get all my cars serviced. So if you're looking for a place to service your classic, call Masterworks, talk to Brian, tell him I sent you their phone number. You can see there's 248-583-0590. Thanks again for watching.